Let's always get a kick out of these white folks who love to lie about DEI, affirmative action, diversity, because their standard protocol is to say that all oh, standards are being lowered if we allow these people in. Well, one of the folks who continues to suggest those things is Elon Musk. Of course, uh, he uh, owns Tesla, SpaceX, and a whole bunch of stuff, richest person in the world, but frankly, an absolute idiot when it comes to these issues. And so uh, he repeated this nonsense uh, in a conversation that he had with uh, Don Lemon. And so uh, I hate to even uh, play uh, this sheer stupidity, but go right ahead. Listen, let's talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion, all right? That's been a target of yours lately on X. You, uh, on, there was a repost of Ben Shapiro that you claim that DEI is killing people. Specifically, you point to medicine. You claim that DEI programs are putting people at risk. Do you really believe this to be true? And what evidence do you have to support it? Um, what I was referring to there was that if, uh, if we lower the standards for doctors uh, so, so that they, you know, get, if, if the test for a doctor is lowered, uh, that, then the probability of them making a mistake and killing someone is obviously going to be higher. Wait, say that again. I'm not sure I understand what you said. I want to make sure I understand what you're saying. I yes. Say. If, if, the, if the standards for passing medical exams and becoming a doctor or, or especially something like a surgeon, if the standards are lowered, uh, uh, then the probability that the surgeon will make a mistake is higher. They're making mistakes in their exam. They, they may make mistakes with people and that may result in people dying. What evidence do you have, though, that they're lowering the standards? There is no evidence of that. What's I your... believe there is. There's no evidence of that, Elon. What, what is the evidence? I, I believe they have literally lowered the standards at, at Duke University, and that is what the article was referring to. There's no evidence saying they have that. not lowered there's, the standards? There's no evidence about uh, lowering standards, and I think that there is... Um, I believe that is a false statement you're making. Okay. Well, well, we'll figure it out. Yeah. I, I think I mean, the interesting thing is, when this is posted on the X platform, there will be a whole bunch of things that rebut what you said and what, what I said, right. and so people can then make their own decision based on the replies and the rebuttals and the community notes. I think that's fair. But I do think that w on this particular topic, I do think that you and Ben Shapiro are, are reaching in uh, about this, because there was a, what, it, what Ben posted said that people were, he gave instances of people who were deliberately uh, harming people. Um, nowhere in the thread does Ben suggest at all, I should say, that anyone is being killed as a, a result of DEI. Um, that's purely speculative. Purely speculative. All right, so... That was their back and forth. Uh, Michael Harriet with The Root joins us right now. Michael, glad to have you on the show. Uh, so, first of all, this is, this is beyond hilarious. And, 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 and here's a piece that people need to understand. In the history of America, this is what white folks have always done. I don't care. Take the area. White folks of all racist white folks like Elon Musk have always suggested, oh, if, if we let them in, everything, quality is going down. Standards are going down. We're going to hell in the handbasket if we let these folks in. He is simply following the footsteps footsteps of white supremacists, white nationalists in the long racist history of the United States. Yeah, he, he definitely is. Well, I always have to begin this conversation, um, first of all, by uh, saying, you know, I'm, I'm with the Grio and that Elon Musk wouldn't be an American if not for the 1965 Immigration and Nationality Act that was the result of the civil rights movement that was basically a diversity program. Like he is an American because of diversity, equity, and inclusion program that was started by black people in America. So we got like, that's the foundation of how he even gets to say these things, right? Like he, he's talking about he's a free speech advocate when he's part of the diversity program that we created. Second thing is, like the insinuation and the conflation of like lower stand standards with diversity, equity and inclusion is just something white people made up. Like none of those programs lower standards to get black people included or to get more black people in leadership. None of them do. Like it's literally illegal for us. Uh, 
a college or a job or a company to do that. They don't lower standards. He's making it up. It The whole thing is premised on a lie. And the thing is that they believe it just because they say it and because they heard it from other white people. And that's the whole thing that you have to start with. And, 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 and the thing here, Michael, the, the, the thing that we have to recognize uh, is that they have in their mind all of these jobs are ours. So how dare any of you step into our area? We're smarter. We're better. He, he, when he was attacking pilots, uh, he was saying, oh, let's show these 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 scores. And so Elon Musk, is, again, is using this uh, it, it, to attack people. I remember the University of Te I remember when uh, during Jim Crow. All these white folks at the University of Texas were concerned uh, about um, about black people coming in. And the president, being the University of Texas, goes, oh, don't worry about it. We have a secret weapon to deal with these Negroes. It's called standardized testing. They're not going to be able to pass the test. In your, in your Twitter thread, you broke down how, oh, first year? Yep. In terms of how... Uh, black and minority students operate, I think it was at uh, Duke uh, in their medical school. But then you show after that first year, oh, they were kicking ass and taking names. That's the stuff they never want to talk about. Right. Because, first of all, everyone in, at every college, like every scholar knows that standardized tests don't predict anything. Like the, all the colleges know it. And so when these colleges who are using data to say, hey, we might as well get rid of this standardized testing and use another metric to determine who we admit into our school, white people, because of the racism that has been embedded in their history and in their culture, they think that you are lowering standards by getting rid of something that doesn't measure anything anyway, but because they have historically performed well on a test that was, if you look at the history of the SAT, it was created to exclude non-white people. Because white people perform better on it, they think that their high test scores is indicative of their merit, of the fact that they belong there. It makes it's proof that they are smarter than all of the other people who have been traditionally excluded. So that's what they start with. And then when they see you getting rid of those tests, when they see more black students coming in because what schools are doing is using other metrics that are not culturally biased as they know that the SAT is, as they know that most standardized tests are, they feel like something is being test taken from them because when it really comes down to it, if you measure how well, how smart someone is objectively, they don't have that advantage, right? They don't have the advantage of a system and a test and and a whole education complex that was built to promote them. And when they see those things being dismantled because they are inaccurate, not just to get black people in, because in no school, no traditionally white education system in America or institution in America has just graciously decided that we want more black people. It don't happen, right? They're using metrics to get more students better students in because the college landscape is very competitive, right? And so when they use better metrics and the white people don't have the advantage that they used to, they think they're being discriminated against. And that's at the foundation of this entire argument. Argument. Well, Michael, I think about uh, Mary Fisher, who sued the University of Texas. Uh, and when the case with the Supreme Court, what was discovered was, oh, you thought black and minority people took your spot. No, it was white students who do, who had, who did, who had lower scores, but they were much broader students. It was white folks. And, and that's the whole deal. And with the Elon Musk of the world, and, and I laid this out in my book, White Fear, how the Browning of America is making white folks lose their minds. This is all a part of this white fear. It's the attacks on CRT, DEI, affirmative action. They're going after every program. They, because this is what I say. White folks are scared. Racist white folks like this are scared to death to compete. And people need to understand this ain't a conservative thing. 
It's some white liberals who think the exact same way. They are afraid to death that they that their kids are not going to have the same white advantages that they had. And they now say, damn, we got to compete against these black folks and Latinos and Asians and Native Americans. They, they didn't have to compete that same way before when it came to fellow white folks. And what's interesting about what uh, what they believe and what you just said, right, just as that case is um, the University of Texas, right, is that when you go to uh, these colleges, right, and you look at this, the collection of students who didn't make the standards to get in, it's mostly white kids. Remember a couple of years ago when those uh, those uh, researchers did that uh, study on who got into Harvard and Yale and Ivy League colleges, and they they found out that most of the people who got in through a legal loophole was the white people, diversity admissions, children of donors, children of people who work at the universities. Those were the white kids who got in. And if you removed affirmative action, what would happen is those white kids wouldn't be, well, still wouldn't get in. But if you remove legacy admissions, if you remove the children of donors from those loopholes, more black kids would get in. And in a sense, right, those black kids who are at those institutions are upholding the tradition and the reputation of those those uh, those institutions for those mediocre white kids who get in through those legacy admissions and all those legacy donor loopholes that the black kids don't have access to. I'm going to bring in my panel right now, uh, Scott Bolden. Uh, he, of course, lawyer there in Washington, D.C., joins us. Rebecca Carruthers, vice president of Fair Elections, uh, senator out of D.C., Reverend Dr. Todd Yeary, pastor and attorney, former EVP of Rainbow Push Coalition out of Baltimore. Uh, you know what? The, the thing here, Rebecca, uh, and if you got a question from Michael, go ahead. The thing here is we know exactly what Elon Musk is doing, and he's using his ownership of the platform to drive this, he's a lot. That's why he's brought these white trolls back, these white racists back a lot, and then under the guise of get free speech. Uh, but all of this, all of this is by design by people like Elon Musk because what they want to do, it, it, I, I guess they think uh, that uh, th that's going to lead to a bunch of Clarence Thomases. You know, remember he was just so, oh my God, they're not accepting of me, and so he's despised affirmative action since. Whereas it's black folks like me, like. Y'all can go to hell. Y'all can try to question us all you want to, but we know we belong in every damn room we're supposed to be in. Well, here's the thing. Elon Musk is operating the way I would expect a South African who financially benefited from racist apartheid to act. Um, he is not a creator. He is a taker. He purchases companies after the creation um, has occurred, but he doesn't. He hasn't shown that he has specific individual thought where he's able to create and become a billionaire. Instead, he's able to purchase and then further increase his wealth. So my question to you, Michael, is, you know, I'm thinking about what even happened in Alabama today. And I'm thinking about Birmingham Mayor um, Woodfin, who's saying, hey, if the Alabama legislature decides that they want to attack D DEI um, in the state of Alabama, he's going to call for many of the five-star recruits and other top recruits to boycott um, Alabama sports. What do you think it'll take for these racist-led legislatures to understand that DEI is not going to go anywhere, even if they try to um, legislate it out of the state. Well, so I talked to, I actually talked to Woodfin about this. I uh, interviewed him and wrote about it about a week ago. And one of the things, first of all, again, just like Elon, these anti-DEI legislators aren't smart. They just have authority and power because they're white <laughs> in a state that they have, you know, taken control of the political system. But one of the things that they don't realize, like that law technically outlaws the NCAA, which requires the diversity part of every single individual football and athletic program, right? And when white folks- realize, And we know they like, believe in like, DEI I, Saturdays. <laughs> Michael, we know they believe in DEI on Saturday afternoon. <laughs> and, and what someone would do, 
What someone should do, right, is take the playbook that these anti-abortion activists should do and sue one of these schools who has the NCAA um, uh, football team on the basis of it's against the Alabama law now. So y'all got to shut down the football team, right? Like get an injunction against the football team and that will either make them rescind the law or do without their favorite set. Saturday pastime, you know which one white folks are going to choose in, in Birmingham. And, and, and Woodfin makes a great point that he had to raise money. Um, he started this initiative, right, called the Promise Initiative, right, that literally gives every child in Birmingham, a 95 percent black city, um, a, a opportunity to get their education paid for everyone who graduates in the city and goes to a four year or two year institution. Right. He had to raise that money for himself. And then he sits back and watches the University of Alabama and Auburn, which is my alma mater, parachute in on to recruit kids to go to these schools, like literally land helicopters on the football field and say, will you come to our school and we'll give you this money? But they won't help any of those other kids. And now they or ignoring this DEI, this new DEI law on the grounds that we want to stay out of politics. And that's the advantage that whiteness gives them. Scott. I don't know why we even listen to white people talk about DEI and racism, because they, they are the least qualified to define it. Think about it. Want. So whenever they talk about it, they talk about it with ignorance and with white privilege. So Elon Musk racism is even worse than what you all have discussed. Think about it. That in their mind, the only way black people could get into law school and medical school is for it to have a lower standard, right? And the history of affirmative action has never dictated that lesser qualified people of color be admitted or be given jobs. It had never been that. It's to cure past races and discrimination and prejudice against those who were qualified but denied, right? So now they have bastardized the whole piece rooted in ignorance and white privilege. What does their white privilege tell them? No. These spots that they did not earn, that they think they're entitled to, are now, from a fairness standpoint, being taken up by black and brown people who are qualified. But the only way they can justify it in their minds because of their white privilege is to say we're underqualified or that the standards were lower. Usually there's a range of scores and a range of, of numbers that give you a grade. So the idea that if you got a lower grade, if, if this top was 1,000 and you got 950 or even 750, that somehow you're going to make a mistake operating on somebody or you're going to make a mistake flying a plane, it's just completely nonsensical. But this is the rhetoric, right? Because we know that the browning of America is as... as, as um, as Roland often says, they have scared the hell out of them, and they've got to do something to try, try to equalize it in their minds, because in 40 or 50 years, whatever that year is, in 2043, they're going to run out of arguments because it's going to be a country of color. So is there a question in there? Yeah, it's a question. Anybody disagree with anything I just pontificated on? <laughs> <laughs> Well, 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 the deal, you say, what? Well, first of all, you say, why do we listen to them? And here's the reality, Michael. They control, they hold power. And so what they're doing is they right. hold the power. You look at the lawsuits being filed. You obviously look at the Supreme Court affirmative action decision. You look at the lawsuits against the Fearless Fund. Uh, they're now, tar they're going to target every, everybody in corporate America, all of these programs. And so the programs that have been created, that have created some opportunity, and let's be clear, it's not like it's been a, just, just a plethora. Creating some opportunity, they are going to go after every single one of these programs and folk had better understand uh, what's going on. And we're now going to actually see if our so-called allies in corporate America have the intestinal fortitude, Michael, to actually stand up and fight them. Yeah, and, and, and it's exactly what you guys said, because what we have to remember, first of all, is that these these standards that we are talking about, right? Like you never hear them, these people who are so concerned about the state of the education system, 
crusading about why majority black schools are underfunded at about $2,226 less than majority white schools. They don't care about that. They don't care about the SAT being culturally biased. They don't care about um, schools in majority black neighborhoods um, having even smaller libraries. They don't care about the lack of uh, the gap in access to internet. They don't care about any of that. It's only, but only when they get to college or, or have to interact with white institutions do they think of these inequities, right? And they think of it in their favor. But the reality is, right, the truth is, like, the reason they listen to these people it's not because power role, and I, and I hate to disagree with you, but it's just because they're white, right? Like Christopher Rufo, who started this whole CRT thing, he don't have no power. He don't have no, edu he's not educated. He's never spent a day being educated or experienced in the educational system. He literally has no credentials or no nothing. Well, well, no, 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 no. no. So here's the thing. First of all, you, you, you're right. My, 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 you're right. He does it, but you have conservatives who have super majorities, Florida, Texas, yep. Yep. Mississippi, Alabama, Tennessee, South Carolina, North Carolina, Arkansas, uh, again, Texas. And so the Rufos of the world, they create the template. And look, he's already said it. He said point blank. What we do is we create these things in the conservative e echo chamber. Then we drive it there. Then what we want to do is we want to and now we want to we now want to embarrass so-called liberals or mainstream media to force them to cover and then boom they're like yo we got them i mean i remember when he went on joy and reed show discussing crt and people like yo man joy killed him and i said wasn't a good move and, and nothing against joy personally but the reason i said it wasn't a good move because what it did was exactly what rufo wanted he wanted it to be to infiltrate her program in Embassy in BC, and then all of a sudden you begin to see Washington Post, New York Times, LA Times, USA Today. That's what their strategy is. We just have to understand when you're watching their strategy, to your point, like your lawsuit idea is a great one, but you gotta have people who believe in this, who are progressive and others who are equally understanding of strategy. We, we know what they're trying to do. Their whole deal is, is to, and he said it, we want to put everything under anything. You hear black, you hear minority, CRT, DEI, that's exactly what their strategy is. Yeah, I, I and I agree with that. I think part of their strategy, though, is premised on, on the fact that they're just listening to random white people. Like, like <laughs> right. none, of, none of the DEI stuff comes from experienced people it just comes from from random white people Todd let's talk about random white people for a minute because I think that's at the core of of the issue that white paranoia has broken out uh, due to uh, white mediocrity. When we think about what has happened recently in the DEI space on the heels of UNC and the Harvard decisions, uh, we, we have to remember that in the background is a Supreme Court that has been trying to find a creative way to undo Brown versus Board since it was a thing. And so we have a Bakke, we have a UNC, we have a Harvard, because they are intentionally dismantling the leveling of the playing field around inclusion, right? Because at the end of the day, to, to Scott's point, is that affirmative action is not a justification for uh, a false inclusion of someone who's unqualified. It says once you have established that everybody in this pool is now qualified, you can use race as a mechanism to address historic uh, racial inequities, right? It's not that we're hiring unqualified people. We're hiring equally qualified if, if you lower the baseline to include random white people. But if we were really exactly. doing it at the standard that black people do it, the standards would be much higher and it's not even a competition. So Michael, my question for you in the midst of this litigation legislation moment, 
other than just kind of keeping up the strategy where we've always had to fight it out with the current court, 6-3, with state courts. And to, to uh, Roland's point, he basically called out all of the states of the Confederacy who lost, by the way. That's, that's, that's a historical <laughs> fact. This, 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 this replaying of kind of an old tape, what is the thing that we need to be paying attention to before we get, in the words of that Spike Lee joint, bamboozled again? I think one of the things that, like the mis not not necessarily mistake um, assumptions that we have is when we get these victories, when we get an affirmative action into um, to colleges, when we get DEI policies, when we get an abortion law, when we get a voting rights act, we think we won when they never stopped con trying to dismantle it, right? Like they they never like their fight never ended, right? Even though we got the voting rights act, they never stopped trying to stop black people from vote voting. And so I think like we have to realize that everything that we fight for is a continue, we have to keep continuing to make it a reality. And we can never assume that anything is a victory. It is just a step forward that we just have to lean on and make it closer to equality. Because in, in reality, right, like they'll, there's nothing that we achieve that they won't try to dismantle. Right. So we have to simultaneously fight for progress while trying to maintain the advancements that we all we already made. And that like that's just the burden we have in this country. It's unfair. It is exhausting. But it's a thing that we have to realize. Well, and also what has to happen to close this out, uh, we've got to have we've got to stop having these so-called uh, exceptional Negroes act like they're the only ones. If you are a black board member, we need you to do more than just simply uh, pick up a check and you get stock options and help your family. If you're a black senior executive or even a CEO, we need you to do more. We need you to open that damn door and flood the zone like the white boys do. I mean, let's just be real clear. They hire who they want to hire. And it's, a, it's stunning to me. And I've had conversations uh, with black folks who become presidents of organizations and CEO, whether it's media companies or whether it's, you know, pharmaceuticals uh, or any other kind of company. It's like they get in there and it's like, oh, you know, I can't do too much. Uh, that looks the, the hell you can't. The hell you can't. And the bomb, I look at it like, like, like the NFL. The Tony Dungy coaching tree is significant. Uh, if you begin to look at some other black coaches, uh, that's what they do. Uh, I'll pull up in a second, uh, the brother who just, uh, got hired, uh, at the, at the UCLA. Okay. He got 12 coaches on his staff. 10 of them black. That's what you, listen, they got time. I know him for what? Huh? My, I'm saying Mike Tomlin is doing the same thing, right? Like, look at his quarterback room right now. Like, he 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 got it. It's an all black quarterback room, right? Yeah, well, no, that's that's his quarterback room. Uh, but you know, my, Mike ain't had a great record of hiring black offensive and defensive coordinators. But that's another story. He is a capital. Uh, but here's the whole, the, whole, the whole point uh, here is again. Uh, I knew you were. Going. So, <laughs> you got to do it. You can't do it. Can we get you one show without you effing with the capitals? Okay. Don't nobody say nothing about them alphas. Okay. So let's just get through one show. Because you can't. But, but, but let me tell you this. If, if black people in senior C-level suites, if black people who are appointees in high levels in the government, if they don't bring others along as they go along, why the hell are they there? What use are they if they're not opening these doors? If they're just thinking about themselves and their family, got it, okay. But you don't share our values. See, I say this all the time to you, Roland. I'm voting for people and supporting people, whether it's politically or financially or, or charitably. I support people who share our values, who because black people ain't always supportive of our values as black people. And those are the ones that are self-serving. I want somebody in those positions who are going to bring others along as they go along, open those doors and be fearless when they are the only ones in that room either making the decision or advocating or persuading people that don't look like them that this is the right thing to do. If they don't have that skill set, they shouldn't be in that position, period, full stop. And Roland, Robert is right uh, here, because here's the bottom my, line. Rebecca, Rebecca, go ahead. 
Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, here, here's the bottom line. And Robert's very right here. When black folks are appointed or be, are elected and become CEO, they're only going to be there for a finite time anyway. So even the whole mm-hmm. idea, I don't really want to rock the boat because I'm scared because I could be kicked out. Guess what? Your black behind is going to be kicked kicked out mm-hmm. at some point. So you might as well do the maximum benefit that you can for black folks while you have the position. This is America. And you're you not going to have that position until you die. And you're going to get kicked out quicker than your white counterparts. So you better get to getting while you're there. <laughs> that, look, that's that's the... You'll get that, up for a year point. or two. Uh, Michael, final comment. <laughs> right. I, Michael, I think, final comment. The bo- I think the bottom line is that, like, white folks and need to stop with their tears and realize that there's some, something called facts and reality. And like no one's tr- coming to take things from them. And all they gotta do is just try to be excellent instead of mediocre. And they wouldn't have to worry about any of this. That's right, fair enough. Well, uh, I agree with you Agree with you there. Uh, and just so y'all thought I was joking, this is the UCLA uh, football coach. Uh, my man, said, Eric Bieniemy, uh is on his team. And you see Deshaun Foster, that's the coach. Look at this here. Uh, associate head coach, office coordinator brother. Got an got a, a Afro-Latino brother as office of defensive line coach. A brother, wide receiver coach. I got uh, uh, Rick Neuheisel's son as a tight end coach. Uh, Brian Norwood uh, is a, a, another black coach. Uh, Cody Whitfield, Ted White, Tony Washington, Marcus Thomas. Uh, uh, okay, uh, Malo, my man got I mean, he, he, look, look, he went out and said, hey, this is how we going to do it. I, actually, I said, too, he got, he got one white coach on his staff. And let me be real clear. If this was any other uh, team, guess what? And they had one black coach. <laughs> Would nobody be saying nothing? Cause they used to that. They, they used to that. That's how you do it. All right, <laughs> Michael Harris. I appreciate it, my brother. Thanks a bunch. Look at this, CC Scott. I told you. You know when, when you got Omegas with some sense, I bring them on like Michael. I bring them <laughs> oh, on. Really? Oh so really? Oh You know I. I, 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 I uh, look, that 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 there there are exceptions to Omegas and Cash. <laughs> All right, we got to go. Uh, let me. <laughs>